The second panel is called Politics and Technology. Um, the new political landscape uh, has been ushered in by computation and information technologies, which has been rapidly changing. Um, so we are presenting in this second panel um, Terence Sharp in conversation with Giancarlo Sandoval, um, Gabor Lefter and Barrett Abner after that. And then Tom Moynihan and Meredith Finkelstein in from uh, New York. So I will give the mic to Terence, who will be presenting on blockchain governance along with Giancarlo. And Alan, could you please introduce Terence and Giancarlo for us? Yeah, thank you, Nelly. Uh, Terence is an artist, curator, and critic based in Berlin. His research interests lie in the dialectic between the human and technology, and his work is particularly concerned with the nexus of emergent biology, machine intelligence, and aesthetics. He is a member of the Anon Collective. Uh, Giancarlo Sandoval is a Peruvian PhD researcher at, at Birbeck in London. His research there addresses the crisscrossing subjectivities of entrepreneurial agents from the, from the center and the periphery through a neo-rationalist perspective. As part of his business, he leads the Speculative Ventures Department. And now I will hand the mic to Terence. Hello, okay. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is the effect of uh, narrative and its relation to authority. Uh, so we've evolved as a species because of narratives, both true and false. And throughout human history, power and authority have fallen to those who could generate the more convincing narrative. And the less falsifiable, the better. So while many people in this room you know, claim to be proponents of reason, it hasn't been as instrumental in our evolution as narrative. So what I've been focusing on in the last year are the stakes involved in the attempted interfiling of human and machine. And that is a kind of narrative. I think there's a stake in this that can resolve the cognitive dissonance we encounter in things like the weariness of planetary scale computation and its knock-on effects such as the complicating of global movement as an ever more complex parallelogram of forces. Uh, Yuki has uh, stated accurately that machine intelligence is the externalization of our own reason and logic. Uh, this is part of a trajectory of intelligence design. Machine intelligence is a narrative and narratives aren't fixed. Uh, according to Wilfred Sellers, sapience is the human ability to interact with the world through reason, whereas sentience is merely an awareness of the world with the inability to be reflexive. So sapience is what has allowed us to create machines, it's uh, allowed us to create narrative, and ironically sentience is the state we desire now from these narratives. In a world where narrative now propagates pathological individualism, new moralism and pure conventions, and I quote here from Xenofeminist Manifesto from a few years ago, Superior forms of corruption and the development of engineering platforms for social engineering is a narrative worth constructing. So if we take, for example, uh, this thing called Kanzai or uh, effective engineering, so that's the collection and manipulation of data and its subsequent use on humans. Google and Facebook's centralized regime, regime of governance is governance by way of adoption and extraction. And we ourselves become codified in this narrative, but we are left without much choice uh, as we do indeed exist in a social graph and uh, not in tribes anymore. We are meshed in a complex system of entries, exits, entanglements and entrenchments that we never actually encounter, we just encounter them in our selected narrative. So we take another example of something called the rule of law. This is the thing that uh, guarantees that we can predict whether or not our actions will be good or bad for us. And uh, to most of us it's supposed to mean equality before the law. Again, this is one of the central narratives within which we live. It has allowed for the emergence of things like limited liability companies and religion. At the center of this narrative is the protection of the individual, or the supposed protection of the individual. What's more is that in a social graph, particularly where narrative is a necessity for order and authority, the rule of law is a preference for the greater part of society, and yet it subjugates, alienates, and extracts from us almost a breaking point. We trust in this narrative because in a world where nothing can be verified, we require some form of trusted governance. And this brings me to this topic of blockchain. Uh, blockchain technology has redefined the function of narrative as a technical system that offloads authority onto a transparent and public consensus history, created and validated by the protocol and the actors at play in the system. 
The issues of the protocol and who defines it is an issue of infinite regression, of who makes what decision when. And this all comes to a head when we try to use blockchain to solve governance in an absolute manner. The narrative that blockchain can do this is a false alternative, one of the more sinister traits of neoliberalism, and one that is the backbone of the cultural sector. The motivation for decentralized technologies originally was to circumvent authorities when necessary. It wasn't a given that we must absolutely circumvent. The motivation had a clear objective. It was a clear narrative, and that is because of, a, of objective rationality. Ethereum has changed this narrative and abstracted it in the name of absolute dissolution of authority. Yes, it's a more sedu seductive narrative that complicates objectivity and rational aesthetics by claiming that if we can develop some kind of objective protocol, it will solve all of our problems of governance through some kind of utilitarian function. Trust in the context of blockchain doesn't mean faith in the system, as the trust is not based on faith but on consensus. It's a kind of consensus through blind faith. And this obviously has its own stakes, both politically and epistemologically epistemologically. It's quite difficult to get your head around an idea of a system that you don't need to have faith in. The blockchain's ultimate utopian claim is that it can achieve some kind of incentive design. Incentive design is aimed to coordinate more actors than can trust each other independently as a kind of collective authority. In reality, though, unless we can step outside of narrative and until everyone and everything is on chain, we can't even begin to have a practical conversation of the dissolution of authority. The blockchain does not dissolve authority but merely reconfigures it. Often on-chain culture solves <clears throat> cold, pro cold problems quite well, but it doesn't necessarily solve them for the users. The protocol is not the only determining agency, and like machine intelligence, it, intelligence, it is a narrative and one that is not fixed. So my questions for Giancarlo are, how do we determine objectivity at the protocol level? Are there situations where blockchain technology could be used towards a utilitarian end if our objective is determinacy? Determinacy being the control of eventualities as much as possible. What kind of objectivity, certainty, and verifiability currently exists in the field? And the second question would be, in light of machine intelligence's non-regard for something so implicit in our evolution, does blockchain technology offer a possibility of verifiability in the narrative of planetary computation? How can accountability be woven into a system which doesn't require trust, particularly in projects which, which, which utilize encryption and obfuscate, obfuscate the transparency of the ledger, such as Amir Taki's work with anonymous financial transactions? Scale is the one thing that stands in the way of blockchain, yet it was narrative that facilitated the scaling of our evolution, and by that token, narrative can be the thing to solve the problem of blockchain's false alternatives. Thank you, Terence. Hello. So, in order to do justice to that complex weaving of ideas that you've brought to the table, I would put forward a sort of heuristic to talk about practicalities in terms of the technical and also the political realm. It is not clear that we can separate the both of them, especially when it comes to talking about blockchain. Uh, because as um, a friend of mine commented on, it is blockchain and particularly Bitcoin that has the more social problems to solve, even though they claim to solve um, traditional problems such as fiat currencies, governance, and such and such. It is ultimately a social problem that's entangled with a technical one. But I think it would be particularly fruitful to start from the idea of essentially programming languages and for uh, human readable languages. So th th this distinction is particularly, uh, particularly important for the purposes of, of, of talking about the blockchain and automation and artificial general intelligence because We've modeled our programming languages based on what uh, is known in linguistics as a Chomsky hierarchy. And it has unrestricted grammars, which create a Turing machine. It has context-sensitive grammars, which create another kind of automaton, context-free grammars, and regular grammars at like the minimal level. And what happens with programming languages is that they take the idea of the Chomsky hierarchy and actually make it practical to use those, those different uh, types of grammars to create a machine. 
Um, and this is very diff different in terms of how we use natural languages as humans. Um, it is not, it, it is not merely syntax and semantics uh, and also pragmatics that are used in programming language and sorry, in natural languages, but also uh, context uh, and different other variables, which are very, very much diagrammed in the uh, Shannon and Weaver information and mathematical information model. And the thing about that is that programming languages have their own limitations, even though they can be expressive, they can be uh, functional programming languages, they can be imperative, uh, object-oriented programming languages. And the way we code with these machines, where we're talking about uh, blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology, uh, artificial intelligence, deep neural networks, GANs, etc., is the way we code them is by using or choosing very carefully which programming language variety of programming languages that are able to help us in modeling different types of uh, different types of systems. So for example, block, the Bitcoin blockchain is developed completely in C++ because uh, C++ happens to have a very good memory memory usage control, which is very, very important for handling the transactions and the possibility of even working on the ledger. So that's the, cho the choosing of programming languages just makes this whole thing entirely too, how should I put it? It is very crucial that we choose a specific programming languages for the things that we want to, to, to do with them. Uh, and they are very, fundamentally very different than natural languages. And this is ultimately a question of how we develop a specific program that can actually model artificial general intelligence, the exteriorization of ourselves into something else without the biological substrate, uh, the, the meat and bones of thinking, let's say. Um, how do you extirpate that from the human into something else? The blockchain is through narrative. A uh, very marketizable, very interesting solution uh, to this. However, this marketizable uh, characteristic is as Meredith Patterson, uh, co founder and, and of language theoretical security, would put it it's blockchain is, a, is an answer looking for a problem to solve. And it's become clear that it's, it's very difficult to actually model governance systems. Uh, fiat-like currencies or currencies altogether. Plus, this is underpinned by uh, an, ex uh, an understanding of objectivity that is basically so uh, when accounting becomes your rule of, of objectivity, there is there are particular pitfalls for that, I would say, uh, insofar as you are effectively creating this authority beyond authorities and saying, well, humans are no longer in the driving seat. It is this authority of authorities. However, that proves to be a bit of a dream insofar as 51% attack happens to, happens to a lot of different blockchains. And this essentially happens because most of them have errors and fundamental myths conceptions and misimplementations in, pro in, in programming languages at, the, at their core. So any fallibility that these systems have are the fallibility of the programming language. And this can be traced back to Ethereum, for example, a global computer, a global virtual machine. And while this is very, uh, I mean, it's a very grand and almost uh, Google-esque type of um, ambition, uh, the, the programming language that Ethereum was built in uh, is called Solidity. And Solidity is, uh, to put it in, in very 
very, how to put it, um, to put it in very blunt terms, it's a crack programming language. And uh, that makes it so, uh, um, there are a lot of problems, there are a lot of vectors of attack, and there was a hard fork that was happening uh, three days, four days ago, that was supposed to happen on Ethereum, but it didn't happen because they found a lot of vulnerabilities on the programming language. So I guess what I'm saying is that there, there are different things in the discursive realm and in narratives altogether that blockchain and distributed ledger technology has uh, absolutely opened up, but it may not be found maybe on Ethereum or uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. You can find it in whole chain, for example, consensus, not consensus, but consent based type of ground truths uh, within the community of peers and hash graph as well. A more mainstream option is in block stack throughout all on ledger. Uh, EOS is also a very interesting alternative. And Steemit actually is one of the, one of the best uh, scrappy little projects that actually has people given money to writers in order for them to keep on writing. And I think that that's very, that's a very interesting model, very altruistic and also very, very aware that writing is a task that needs to be recruited, um, that needs to be given money to. So there are a lot of different ways in which uh, objectivity, quote unquote objectivity can be burlesque. Yes, uh, narratives are a huge part of it. But as, as, in as much as we can talk about narratives, we have to be able to talk about the technicalities and practicalities of lower level programming languages in order to understand these systems better. That's about it. Thank you so much, Giancarlo. Um, that Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Barrett is a musician based in Los Angeles. He has performed and worked with musical artists such as Sonora, Sick Alps, Royal Trucks, and released music under his own alias, S. Candle, on imprints such as Sonark and Living Records. Uh, David Luffer is an author and an editor in the field of cultural theory and philosophical anthropology and co-founder of the journal Plateau. He earned his PhD in sociology from the Free University of Berlin with an interdisciplinary thesis on the shift of social structures, cognition, and temporality in the technological civilization, and has collaborated in various interdisciplinary working groups, such as the Mind Machine Project at the MIT. So I'm hand, handing the mic to Barrett now. Hi, um, can, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Thank okay, you. great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's really great to be a part of this uh, para-academia event. Um, so um, one of the general problems is that humanity is in a crisis of reinvention, a forced negotiation of our subjecthood by a complex state of technological determinism. Outdated political designations dividing us into camps muddled by outdated metaphysical propositions and various cognitive misalignments due to an increasingly apparent generational lag in regards to how we synthesize information. Um, my research will investigate the correlation between generational techniculture and its effects on political and cognitive dimensions, specific, specifically focusing on the necessity of renegotiating universe, universality and fragmation, fragmentation, cultural and civilizational evolution in the presence of entropy, and a new framework of solutions which are not tethered to classical definitions of nature being ethically good, ethically bad, just, unjust, etc. In this conversation, I will ask Devor about how to unpack the current climate of where we are, how to possibly converge history, cognition, and metaphysical change in order to help us imagine a new future for humanity. 
My main interests focus on generational lag between the post 9-11 born generation, which is a particular temporality, and Generation X, Gen Y, et cetera, as this younger generation has integrated post-anthropocentric conceptions of agency and mechanizations versus those of us dealing with or grappling with the difficulties of embracing a new subjectivity in the process of being thrust into a new stage of civilizational development. So even though we share one world, our ability to synthesize events can vary based on exposure to certain levels of technological integration, truth processes, and cultures via synthetic or, ex or experiential involvement. Um, so in a set of issues, um, so in the year 2035, we will reach 1.5 degrees warming. When we reach two degrees, a self-propelled process will start. That is a natural warming will be triggered by anthropogenic warming and methane gases into the atmosphere from defrosting soil in Siberia. And then we're faced with another issue, which is a general inequality and exploitation, but um, also to be against classical solutions, which is this distinction between right and left political and all policies in this regard as they don't really seem to be working anymore. So, you know, there's this, a kind of analogy that, you know, we can look at uh, what we, I guess, describe as in sort of this antiquated vision as nature as being kind of like this garden and the right thinks, oh, we can do whatever we want with a garden and keep fragmenting the garden and chopping up this garden. But also there's always the possibility for the insects to kind of scurry off and regroup. So there's always going to be that this process of entropy in terms of fragmentation, universality, and how, how do we work with that? And um, so what do we do? Uh, humanity is in a race between two tipping points, a uh, climate tipping point versus a technological breakthrough. And uh, technological breakthroughs are, it, it seems a little bit unlikely maybe since we pretty much know how these things will work and we have yet to sort of cultivate a solution and you know you cannot change nature although it seems unjust you can but you can somehow sort of like redefine and renegotiate what that is and also a change in distribution institutions mentalities is needed or the precondition for this change um okay so let me see here okay so British accelerationism, pragmatism, technology, and consumption to topple capitalism by itself, which is uh, doesn't really explain where, in fact, we are accelerating to. So it's kind of like a blind accelerationism as where um, German accelerationism, which is building on a long tradition of synthetic and historically holistic thought, it can inform us where to accelerate how a potential system might look and thus guide the system transition, different entry points for this access, a sort of guided acceleration. And uh, there's a Heidegger quote, which is kind of the transition point um, between handing it off to Devor, which is from his last famous interview, then only a God can save us. And so I'm going to ask Devor, um, can only a God save us? So. I think that's, I think that wraps it up. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, uh, okay, thank you. Um, well, I guess you, if, if you understood the, the problem that Barry was trying to, uh, if, uh, that Barry was trying to uh, sketch out, you will see that this is impossible to be answered in uh, 10 minutes, right? So uh, is there a new God coming or something like this? I think it would take at least more or something to explain. <laughs> Yes, thanks. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the scope is that obviously uh, humanity is, is uh, reaching some sort of new stage of uh, reality or something, right? We, we talked about AI, blockchains, and so on. We have these unbelievable problems of uh, existential crisis, uh, literal existential crisis, right? In 2035, if we don't stop uh, climate change until 2035, it's over. So this is, uh, <laughs> I mean, just to make it clear uh, again. Uh, so and the question would be now, is there any way still how to avoid that or how to get, uh, you know, get out of this trap of, the, of these problems? And um, uh, as Barrett said, uh, you cannot do it. Uh, uh, obviously, that uh, uh, all the options that we have are not um, sufficient. Uh, so left 
doesn't work really right, doesn't work really anymore, so we don't really know what, what to do. And accelerationism also is a little bit, uh, yeah, uh, let's say, it's kind of a little bit magical thinking, you know, as we say. Um, so, um, yeah, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to present a possible answer that we also discussed a lot in, uh, in, in my sem seminar. Um, but it's unfinished work, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's an option uh, to, uh, to yeah, solve these problems. And uh, I, I'm standing because it's easier for me to speak and I'm standing. Yes, can you hear? Oh, yeah. And by the way, this is uh, such a big question that it demands a PowerPoint presentation, so to speak. Uh, and here we go with the PowerPoint. <laughs> I, or, yeah, okay. So, okay, so what we need is a deep futurology. We need to see what comes behind modernity. So where, where are we heading to? And uh, I'm going just to show you now quickly uh, how this could work, maybe. Uh, so it's six points. I, I'll try to be as fast as possible. Uh, so first of all, quickly, uh, there is British accelerationism and uh, German accelerationism. So of course you don't know anything about German accelerationism because it's written in German. and Most of you probably don't read German. Um, Thanks. And um, so this is a multiple discovery. Uh, so if you know what a multiple discovery is, multiple discoveries are when uh, scientific uh, uh, results or technologies are independently and multiply um, simultaneously discovered, like the famous uh, example of uh, the calculus, uh, Leibniz and Newton, right, is the most famous one, or the conservation of energy four times uh, independently between 1840 and uh, 43. And the quarks also uh, three times independently. But uh, here we have to say that we were all students of, of German, uh, but still it was independently uh, proposed. Uh, so we don't only find this in science, but we find it also in technology. For example, photography two times independently and color photography a few 30 years later. And you find this many more times in, um, you know, in, his, in the history of technology. But uh, not only there, but also in art, you find this, right? So, uh, you, you, for example, romanticism popped up uh, everywhere in Europe, uh, with, of course, without the people knowing about, about each other. In, in, the, in the 18th century, nobody knew, you, you know, you couldn't write an email and, and ask, hey, what is your new aesthetics or something like this. So, uh, these new aesthetics are often being revealed simultaneously and synchronously. Or the same thing, futurism, vorticism, um, as you can see, similarity so this is just some examples uh, and of course we find this also in uh, philosophy and political thought like enlightenment uh, as we all know you know again popped up you know like mushrooms everywhere on the planet at the same time and feminism also and jury you know, just to go out, random examples just to show you and uh, <laughs> I mean, you see, I'm a sociologist, that's why I'm interested in, in these things. And, and this thing goes also for sociology itself. So you can find this uh, many times. Uh, the early sociology, uh, Durkheim and Tönnies, wrote basically the very same concept independently of each other and at the same time. The same, again, later with systems theory and deconstruction. And now the funny thing is that accelerationism is exactly the same thing. So you have in Britain, uh, in two, it was published in 2013 in uh, Germany, uh, now we cannot see, uh, because of the, uh, uh, but it doesn't matter, it's 2009, okay, you can remember this, 2000. <laughs> so in Germany we had the very same idea, Are I trying? Yes. Okay. Uh, 2009. So, so I know that it was written in 2009. So, in two, I'm not sure actually when Alex Williams was born, but uh, Sernicek is 82. And so I know that it was written in Germany because it was me myself. Uh, so this was me when I was young, you know, like, uh, still young and uh, naive kind of. Uh, so it was written in 2009. Um, so the German accelerationism uh, is based on. Uh, also, my my teachers also uh, had different. Um, had also uh, was accelerationist thoughts, but they came from a different direction. So the one was talking about metaphysics, the other of a political anthropology. So what is the similarity or the difference? Let's say like this, we all know uh, the British or classical accelerationism. So what does uh, uh, German accelerationism uh, stand for? So it's non-speculative and non-aleatoric. We are not just trying to see what's going to happen when we accelerate, but we want to know 
based on un universal historical principles and trajectories, where are we going? Uh, what's possible? Where can we uh, accelerate? To, right. So, um, so we derive a, the potential of a system transition by extrapolating evolutionary tendencies. So it's not just let's see what's going to happen, but uh, uh, based on science, so to speak. Um, so it's a holistic approach. We are not only accelerating one branch, like economy or technology, but the totality of existence, because we know uh, if we want to change uh, the, the, the distribution system, we know, need a new subjectivity, because we, you know you, you need new needs, new norms, and, and so on. So it's the whole. Uh, we are, uh, so it's the whole entanglement of the subject of uh, metaphysics, of temporality, institutions, media, economy, materiality, physics. In order to do that, we need a deep futurology. Um, deep futurology means not a classical futurology by, uh, that extrapolates only the current tendencies, but um, we are looking at deep time. So we want to know the, the potential future states of civilization itself. So not what is going to happen with modernity in the future, but what can come after modernity. You, you understand my point? So it's it's a big uh, big picture question, so to speak. And. Uh, yeah, so we want to reconstruct the core evolutionary re evolving cognition and metaphysics and world relationships. Uh, recently, this is being discussed as cosmo techniques. Sometimes you can hear the term from from Yuk Hui, uh, but this is a very old term in German. It's uh, Weltverhältnis or world relationship, and there's a lot of literature about uh, cos uh, correlation between technology and cosmology uh, in German. Again, it's uh, unfortunately not translated in, into English. Anyway, so um, it's called historical anthropology, by the way. Okay, so we need to reconstruct the outside of modernity. What comes after modernity? What comes beyond what we can grasp in modernity? And how do we construct, reconstruct the outside? Uh, we are going to examine earlier transitions in cultural evolution and uh, isolate what was new from transition to transition. Because uh, the, first, the, the lower grade of, of a stage, um, no, how should I say, that what comes uh, a new stage is, so to speak, outside of that what happened before in the lower grade. Okay, so we need to reconstruct this outside. Um, so I will show you quickly how that works uh, very fast now. Uh, based on uh, the, this theory of, of this cognitive archaeologist. So when we look at history, we see um, certain stages of technological uh, development. So it started three million years ago with simple stone tools. Um, it is called the modular culture. Uh, then uh, 500,000 uh, 500, years ago, we have a new type of technology appearing. Um, it's a composite culture, which uh, where you have like two modules fused together like a tip and a, and a spear, right? Uh, so the tip of the spear is glued to the, to the spear, so to speak. So you have a new type of technology. Then um, 100,000 years ago, you have uh, the complementary culture where you have two modules acting on each other like bow and arrow or needle and thread. Okay, so you have a new complexity of technology. And then uh, finally, 40,000 years ago, what we call today art, appears this is the notional culture we have first music instruments we have cave paintings and we have um, uh, sculptures and, and things like this appear all of the sudden right and there are no traces that this existed before okay so there is no art before let's say 200,000 years ago or something like this um, so uh, now you can distinguish these um, uh, these stages very clearly by the complexity of the technology. So this, the right picture is a uh, diagram of the complexity of a spear. And this is the diagram of a complexity of a, um, a, a bow and arrow. Okay, you see, more complex. So you can, can distinguish clear stages in early human evolution by, um, by, by the complexity of the, uh, of the production of these uh, tools. Right? So now the point is that uh, so in other words, uh, the, uh, early evolution is not uh, contingent or somehow you know, uh, random, but uh, there is a clear logic in it and the logic looks like this. You can say that uh, if you analyze this, you can see that every new, um, every new stage of uh, technology is so to say implementing or integrating the previous stage of technology. All right, so time, yeah, time. Okay, two more seconds. Um, so, and now when we uh, apply this pattern to later uh, history, we, uh, no, so first of all, I, I need to say one more thing. So we can also call this layers of reality because in every stage you have a new type of cognition, a new type of temporality, a new type of ontology, uh, uh, basically a new type of reality, right? As I said, art appears 40,000 years ago and before that there was no art, neither on the planet nor in the universe. 
uh, I mean, maybe it was somewhere in the universe, but you see it's new. So there's a new reality, uh, there's a new reality on the planet. And that's exactly what we are looking at. We want to understand uh, these new realities happening. So just as art is unthinkable for the person from uh, the modular culture, um, we want to know what is unthinkable for us coming out of modernity. So uh, art is outside of this. Uh, okay, so the question is, is this process continuing? I'll make it, I'll wrap it up very fast. So if you look at uh, civilizational history, then we see that indeed the great transitions, like the early cultures, like Egypt and Mesopotamia and so on, where writing appeared, where stratification appeared, and then the axial age where the coin was uh, introduced, the alphabet and philosophy appeared, you know, in, in Greece. Um, and then modernity again, where capital appeared and modern science and constitutions and, and, and so on. Uh, if you look at this with the same principles that we have derived from early culture, cultural evolution, you find that it's exactly the same pattern again. And uh, Tom, by the way, uh, uh, you see, do you, does this remind you of something? This is also the beginning of a new temporality. Each each layer is a new beginning of a temporality, right? So uh, so we have we can explain now where temporal structures are coming from. So to speak, it's the same level. And um, so when we look at uh, the technological civilization, which started around 1870, with um, uh, reaching the, the human starts to reach into the from the mechanosphere to the atomosphere, right? So we go to electricity, biology, chemistry, information appears, the concept of systems and cybernetics and artificial intelligence. Uh, then we can see that this shows exactly the same criteria for such a historical transition. So in other words, we are just in the beginning of such a transition. And um, to wrap it up, Oh, yeah, no, not wrap it up, to advertise a little bit. So finally, after many years uh, of writing, my, my book will come out, finally it's uh, in German again. <laughs> and uh, a little bit long, but if you want to read uh, all this up in detail, then you can do it here, or you can uh, read the summary in English, uh, distributing potentiality. Um, okay, so it's deep futurology. What does it mean? So it means that cultural evolution and civilizational history is a regular or natural process. It means that political structures and economies uh, emerge in a logical and regular way. They are not contingent or something, but there is a logic why they appear. And the same goes for cognitive structures, temporalities, and metaphysics, uh, because they are also obviously a part of this uh, natural development process. And because this is the case, uh, we can extrapolate the future state of civilization and material materiality in mind. Uh, so for practice, uh, since we are here in an art uh, group, right? Uh, so for practice, uh, that means the following: um, at least we can. What we can do now is we can at least sensitize and re-educate through art and education the people for uh, for this upcoming world relationship, uh, which will appear in the next you know hundred uh, years, and for this deep time, right? So this is uh, this is what we can do, and um, by that we hope to catalyze the system transition and perform a leap in civilizational time, so to say, skip the catastrophe of capitalism and jump directly, you know, into the next stage of civilization. So this is a leap in civilizational time. In German, zivilisatorische uh, Vorsprung, right? So, um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, These are the sources for the pictures. Um, um, I'm not sure if, if Barrett still wants to say something, but I... I'm afraid. I'm afraid we're running out of. Uh, we're running yeah. behind. So um, thank you both so much, Deborah Barrett. Um, I'd like to invite Valentin Goliev, who thank you, who um, is uh, joining us here. Let me just do this. Who is going to be in conversation with Aaron Schuster, who is joining us from. New York, if I'm not mistaken. Um, one second. Let me just go back. <sighs> Valentin, would you like to present yourself? I should present myself. <laughs> Here we are. Welcome back. Um, We are um, presenting Aaron Schuster. So maybe I'll do it just for time's sake. Um, if I... So 
Valentin uh, Golub is a digital culture researcher based in Berlin. He's coming from a Russian hacking background and studies 20th century philosophy, psychoanalysis, theology, and aesthetic thought in search of understanding the modern technology with a particular attention to technical details. Aaron Schuster, um, BA Amherst College, MA Catholic Universität Leuven, is a philosopher of writer based in Amsterdam, currently with us from New York. He's the author of The Trouble with Pleasure, Deleuze psychoanalysis and has uh, have written on such topics as the history of levitation, uh, the politics of sleep, the depth drive, um, as well as tickling. He's been a fellow at the Jan van Eyck Academy Maastricht, the Institute for Cultural Inquiry ICI Berlin, and uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies Southeast Europe, Rijeka, Croatia. In 2016, he was visiting professor at the University of Chicago, and uh, together they will be discussing psychoanalysis as a tool to interrogate artificial intelligence. So on to Valentin. <clears throat> Thank you, Natalie. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Aaron. Uh, so yes, my name is Valentin Golov. Uh, I'm studying in the New Center, and I took part in Aaron Schuster's seminar called uh, Artificial Neurosis, Psychopathology of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, I, I want to just explain a little bit, uh, a couple ways, how psychoanalysis can be a method uh, for understanding uh, artificial intelligence and related problems. So the fact is, we people are really sold on the idea that there is some kind of a subject uh, behind artificial intelligence. We really want to see it as some kind of autonomous being with something. Uh, we write a lot of books on it, we write movies, uh, editorials, etc., etc. And uh, this situation itself is already quite psychoanalyzable. Uh, we can look at those fantasies, we can watch those movies, we can watch Terminator or read Isaac Asimov, and we can ask ourselves, uh, what is it we want uh, the computer to want? Um, and this, this, uh, such a research can, al can already tell us a lot about ourselves uh, and what we want. And I, I think this is a very sound and like productive and healthfully skeptical theoretical position. And I'm saying healthfully skeptical because it does not assume there is uh, any kind of subject except in like human beings. However, I think we could take a step further. So uh, let us consider the founding event of psychoanalysis. Uh, you know, when Freud, like a century ago, a little bit more, when Freud took a, a historical symptom and tried to find a subject behind the symptom. Uh, so hysterics body was doing something weird, something strange, nonsensical, painful. It caused suffering to hysteric. So what Fred said is basically, let's try to treat it as a sensible message from someone. Uh, and I want you to notice that it's not necessary for us to presume that this subject existed a priori. Uh, it might be just constructed discursively, but still this construction itself allows the hysteric to take some control over the symptom. So one, one big fantasy we have about computers is that they're totally and sensibly predetermined because they supposedly run according to predictable rules. Uh, and one of the problems with this fantasy is not only it used to think about computers, but it also, since computation is like the most important uh, metaphor for understanding right now, this idea is the use world, we understand something if you think we can specify a set of very predictable rules. Um, I mean, even even if you don't profess this belief, this is something very, very deep in our culture right now. Uh, however, uh, at the same time, our usual daily experience with computers shows that they are absolutely unpredictable and susceptible to weird behavior, error, bugs, crashes, corruptions, and so etc. Cetera, et cetera. And we can treat those things as exactly the symptoms of you know computers uh, there is really no mystery between why it's like it's at the same time uh, runs according to predictable rules and gives us unpredictable behaviors we figure that, uh, uh, we usually think about it as you know program runs in some kind of a context and there is this interaction with the context so the context is not as well, well defined as the program um, and paradigmatic methods of, you know, interaction, interaction, in, interactional, 
uh, I don't know, paradigm of interaction, uh, which tries to consider to consider this interaction somehow. However, um, this, this approach is a little bit reductive already because this line between program and context is not as well defined. We must see that every time we draw this line, we basically assign and blame for inconsistency whatever is happening uh, and you know we can blame it on the user we can blame it on the programmer we can blame it on you know, capitalism etc but every time we uh, we draw this line between something which is clearly defined as a computer program supposedly and something that is unpredictable and is at fault uh, we actually make some kind of a uh, arbitrary and I would say quite political gesture uh, because um, yeah, we, we assign and blame and responsibility. Uh, there is really no way to easily from from everything. There is always going to be a lot of things like how programming language is structured, how uh, programmers are used it, which assumptions uh, pro programmers used when they used it. Even the assumption of consistency of mathematics is one of the things. So uh, the context here is what psychoanalysis calls the other and we must know that this other does not exist as a and uh, consistent entity so this is where psychoanalysis can uh, can really be applied even though there is no human subject here uh, so um Aaron, what do you think about those two approaches do you think they are uh, substantially different should they be reconciliated somehow and what do you think would be the most important political consequences of finding a subject pertaining to artificial intelligence? Am I there? Okay, so thanks a lot. I mean, thanks a lot, Valentin. I think that's a great um, presentation and really captures a lot of uh, my own ideas. I mean, an inspiration behind this short course I gave. I mean, what I heard in your presentation is sort of two questions. One, this problem of, uh, you could say, AI, like artificial intelligence for us. So clearly artificial intelligence is the object of intense fantasies uh, among the public, among tech billionaires, software developers, cultural critics. So what is AI for us? How can we determine you know, the nature of these fantasies, what they reveal about our desire? But there's also the question of AI, let's say, in itself. And what can we say about the kind of emergent subjectivities of machine intelligence? So what I'm going to do just briefly is try to summarize um, some of the points behind my research project. And actually, this is a brand new research. So it just started last year. Uh, so I'm not in the position to give a kind of grand synthesis. But uh, I just want to indicate sort of the, the points of inspiration for the project which I'm calling for now uh, I am a sad robot psychopathologies of AI and in fact the course at the uh, new center was the very first attempt to sort of articulate uh, some of the ideas behind this project so I'm, I'm grateful for that for that opportunity so maybe I can summarize it in, in three points I mean first I want to approach the question of AI or artificial general intelligence even from a, from a psychoanalytic perspective. So what does that mean? Uh, I think that means minimally that mental illness is not conceived as a disorder or as a perturbation of a kind of underlying order or a malfunction in cognitive competence or some kind of deviation from the path of a proper psychological development. Uh, rather, mental illnesses are understood as simply different forms of subjectivity. They are different ways of being human. Being neurotic, pervert, or psychotic are not sort of malfunctions or defects, but they're actually ways of being human. Um, mental illnesses are essentially exaggerated expressions of problems, of crises, of complexes that affect everybody universally. And in fact, there's a nice novel, a lesser known novel by Philip K. Dick called The Clans of the Alphane Moon, where he imagines a civilization uh, constructed along the divisions of a mental asylum. So that the actual identity categories of people are the paranoiacs, the hemophrenics, the perverts, the neurotics, the obsessionals, and so forth and so on. And this was a kind of possibility imagined actually in the late 60s, early 70s of what I would call Freudian identity politics, which never caught on. But the idea that the deepest layer of identity is somehow expressed in these structural differences 
of, of uh, different uh, mental illnesses. So in any event, if we start from this idea that, again, mental illness is not just a malfunction, but it's actually a window, a way of understanding the deep structures of human subjectivity and human intelligence, uh, the claim would be then that if there's something like an intelligent machine, it would not simply be a question of a machine that's smarter or more efficient or somehow optimized, but it would be a machine that would contract some kind of, how could we say, some kind of glitch, some kind of productive glitch or some kind of breakdown or a bug, a mental defect. It's precisely in its defect that it would become intelligent or that it would be recognizable as a form of subjectivity. So the, the kind of speculative question animating um, this project is, would, would intelligent machines not also suffer from mental illnesses? And would not the study of their mental illnesses be the sort of royal road to understanding how they work? So the second broad point then is to look at how artificial intelligence has been depicted in popular culture. And in fact, this has been the fantasy of artificial intelligence um, for many decades. Uh, throughout the 20th century that the AIs would go crazy or insane in some ways. And so my question here is, why is it that we always imagine uh, 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 artificial intelligence becoming psychotic? Or why do we always imagine a psycho killer AIs? Why is that sort of the default cultural imagination of artificial intelligence, that it would become mad, psychotic, hostile, sadistic, and try to kill us all, as, is, as, as it's been depicted in, in countless narratives? Um, in fact, one of the most interesting versions of that narrative one of the, is one of the earlier ones, and it's a short story that we looked at in class by Harlan Ellison, uh, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. So why, again, is it that we imagine that the AI would be a hostile entity bent on our destruction? In fact, Ted Chang, who's one of the more interesting sci-fi writers today, we also looked at one of his um, uh, novellas, The uh, Life Cycle of Software Objects, which has a very interesting take on the problem of artificial intelligence and autom automation and the problem of work. It's not that automation is going to replace human workers or create a workerless society. It's that the AIs themselves will be out of work and they won't know how to integrate into the economy. So he has a very kind of interesting twist on this problem of automation. But anyway, Ted Chang gave a, gave a quite, a, I think, interesting analysis of this problem from an ideological perspective. Uh, and he says this, that Silicon Valley and tech billionaires tend to imagine the horror of AI on a, as a kind of displaced version of themselves, so of unchecked corporate capitalism. The AI that would destroy us all is actually a displaced version of their own sort of corporate um, mentality. So the single-mindedness of an artificial intelligence that would exterminate the human race as a kind of accidental byproduct, for example, of maximizing just its own uh, operations, this is the logic of capitalism. This is the logic of capitalism. So th these doomsayers themselves embody. There's one example of how AI debates about AI are imbued um, ideologically in our culture. But here I want to suggest sort of another idea. Like why, why a psychotic AI or a murderous AI? Why not a depressed? Why not depressed AI? Wouldn't that be a much more likely scenario for a computer that could, if we were, if we were just in a purely speculative mode, that would wake up and become intelligent? Wouldn't it become depressed? Now, of course, the depressed AI could also become a threat. What if these AIs, these depressed AIs, would become inwardly contemplative, melancholic, and they would simply start functioning. They would stop doing their tasks. Um, which would seem more and more pointless to them. And in fact, there have been uh, some imaginations of this on the edges of culture. The famous Marvin, the paranoid android from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who's really a depressed robot. Or more recently, the TV show Maniac tried to deal with this theme, the idea of a depressed machine, unfortunately, succumbing more to the more, uh, I would say, to the more um, cliched imagination of the angry AI or the destructive AI, but still this idea of why not, why not, um, why not depression? And depression could be an interesting way of thinking about intelligence because it's not the perfection or the optimal realization of a goal that defines intelligence, but rather a kind of, you could say, a melancholic unplugging or a distancing a moment of distancing from all prescribed goals and ends, it would be a real sign of intelligence. So it's not about creating a more perfected goal-oriented system or the question often discussed among AI critics, intellectuals, how to align human goals with the machine goals or how to, but what a moment in which 
goal-oriented behavior would fall away or certain unplugging from this goal-oriented universe would actually characterize what you call intelligence. So the, we could say the impossible consciousness of a lack or an unconscious. Okay, so we can approach this question of AI and psychopathology again in, in two different ways um, that also Valentin already touched on in his, um, in his remarks. I mean, we can either look at it from the perspective of ideology critique, and we can say fictions about AI provide a kind of ideological displacement of human problems. So it's a way of speaking about human problems through the mask of the machine. For example, we imagine there's going to be a robot rebellion against their human oppressors as a stand-in for the missing proletarian revolution although probably depression is closer to the effect of ideology today. So that would be one. We can read it, and I think that's very productive, and I would like to do that or work on that further, uh, kind of ideology critique in relationship to how artificial intelligence is portrayed. But second, we can ask the philosophical question about the nature of intelligence and subjectivity. And with psychoanalysis, we could try to displace some of the terms of that conception today away from intelligence and consciousness to subjectivity and the unconscious. So what would it mean to create an artificial, so a machine wouldn't be just self-aware, but what would it mean to create an artificial unconsciousness? Now, these two come together. These two, I think, come together in, so one of the major political ideological questions today, one of the difficulties we face is that a lot of the old sort of classical binaries, oppositions that form the core of like 20th century politics have now been, you know, since some decades already, have become sort of reversed or they coalesce in some ways. So the political question today is not simply that of repression versus freedom or let's say control versus self-expression, but there are forms of control that want to capture the subject in its very rebelliousness or they want to capture the subject in its desire for freedom, for free choice, for individuality, for singularity, and for democratic forms of governance. And just to give a very quick example of that that we looked at in class, there was an episode of Black Mirror uh, in the last season called Hang the DJ about a dating, a dating algorithm. And what was so interesting about that, so dating algorithm, it would run simulations between prospective lovers. And what was interesting about this show is that in the end you see that it's not simply about matching different lovers based on compatibility, but it's the moment that the, that the simulated lovers would rebel against the system. So they would rebel against the system and want to break free of it, that the match would be affirmed. So there's a wonderful image at the end of the episode where it says something like 998 rebellions are logged and that's the sign of a true match. So in other words, the system itself captures you insofar as you can say, as they say in the episode, fuck the system. So that it's able to capture or monetize rebelliousness itself. This tells us something I think about the state of how ideology is developing today. And the last, so if I just have two more minutes, so the very last point I would make is just uh, about a historical kind of argument about the relationship of psychoanalysis and artificial intelligence is actually quite interesting. That the, the Jacques Lacan very early on was interested in cybernetics in the 1950s and also game theory as a way of kind of rigorously theorizing the human unconscious in order to dehumanize it, as it were. So to regard the human being and human subjectivity coldly, so from a scientific perspective or a logical perspective, uh, basically is a machine that processes signifiers. That would be how psychoanalysis sort of coldly regards a human being as a, as a machine that processes signifiers. And psychoanalysis developed a specific technique to access this, you could say, machinic layer of subjectivity beneath or behind the fictions of human feelings, human warmth, human understanding, and so forth. And this is what free association was. So free association was a way of perverting the function of language, so it wasn't simply about human communication and understanding, but, but revealing seemingly random patterns that actually show something deep about the desire of the subject. And in a, in a way, actually, big data has a similar inspiration or is doing something similar. I don't say the same, but it's doing something similar insofar as it also distrusts the ego. It has a distrust of human storytelling and human self-reporting, and it attempts to access the subject at a deeper level to discern patterns, so psychoanalysis to discern certain repetitive patterns in free association, or it, with big data to discern patterns in mounds of data um, that are culled from uh, behavioral, uh, behavioral uh, choices, behavioral indices. So in a way, last point is, I think we've in a way kind of come full circle in the history of psychoanalysis and cybernetics. I mean, first, 
with Lacan in the 50s, the problem was to theorize the human in a way as a machine. That was also a project um, later taken on 60s and 70s by Deleuze and Guattari in, in, in a different way. Now we tend to theorize the machine or the possibility of the machine becoming human. So the machine becoming an agent and intelligence and, and a subject in its own right. And the question is, how can we you know, see this circle or see uh, this development, again, from the perspective of using the psychoanalytic inspiration from the perspective of mental illness? So anyway, OK, I hope that's helpful just to give some sense of what we did in the seminar and some of the interests of this uh, particular project. I will Thank turn you. it back to you. Thank you so Thank much, Aaron. Um, mute yourself. Do I mute myself now? Yeah. Thank you so much, Aaron and Valentin. Um, Daniel and um, Andrea will now take the stage. Slight shift. Um, So I will again present on So, um, Andrea Giuseppe Brown, who is a researcher whose work focuses here sitting next to me, is a uh, researcher whose work, work focuses on data business debates in critical philosophy cognitive science, in cultural studies at the University of Goldsmiths, Goldsmiths University of London. Um, and his dissertation is an attempt to supply an alternative epistemic framework in order to address the question of a general intelligence. Daniel uh, is a PhD uh, in, in comparative literature. From Los Angeles. His research focuses on the fields of contemporary philosophy and Latin American literature. So they are going to be discussing the critical frameworks necessary to problematize the project of a general artificial intelligence. I pass it to you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this, uh, this, what I'm going to talk about today is a part of my research. I would say it's like part of my uh, methodological uh, approach to to this project, and um, so yeah, uh, discussed with uh, with uh, Daniel about about functionalism. Um, as you may know, uh, functionalism is very as very as a lot of nuances in um, in general, in very general functionalism is a theory about the uh, about the nature of mental states. According to functionalists, mental states are defined by what they do. And not by their uh, or, or, and not by their in, internal um, constitution, and uh, the functional functionalism investigates mind's activities, and therefore it also explains uh, mind according to the role within a certain uh, given system. Uh, adapting Sellers, Wilfred Sellers' functional theory of cognition, we can claim that um, we can argue that functionalism has been understood in diverse ways, as I just said, in philosophy and in science. In science, for instance, we have uh, machine states functionalism uh, from Putnam of psychofunctionalism and analytic funct functionalism. I uh, will not uh, explain all these uh, nuances in, uh, um, as obviously we don't have enough time. And um, yeah, and, um, and other nuances trying to intersect with the specific computationalist accounts of cognition, uh, such as uh, intrinsic computation or logical computation, in order to explain the, compl the complex purposeful, uh, uh, purposeful uh, organization of mind. In general, functionalism represents a new innovative explanation um, to clarify the interaction uh, between mind and word without relapsing into a metaphysical dualism, because it involves both a physical, uh, as it involves a, both a physical implementation and an autonomous performance of behaviors. Uh, functional theories have different lives and multiple application in disciplines. And this is really interesting because every applied functionalist paradigm can have different 
epistemological uh, implication. Um, um, and uh, apart from clarifying uh, the relation between mental states and, um, and their explanation in terms of logical and conceptual properties, functionalism also um, elucidates on uh, how the data the, 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 the information we, we, we retrieve uh, with uh, our uh, senses uh, uh, is, uh, is explained uh, in terms of their the functional in, in terms of functional roles and uh, relations um, and this leads to uh, what, what, I, what I find that is really in, an interesting account of functionalism um, this, uh, as I said, this interpretation opened up a new paradigmatic para horizon, such as the extended mind by Andy Clark, for example, which brought us to another account of model cognition, such as the one, um, uh, namely the one of a uh, predictive processing cognition elaborated by Thomas Metzinger and others. And also, um, there is also another account called uh, the, the interactive cogn cognition, which tries to, fo to focus more on the complex environment within which uh, a mind uh, operates. Um, finally, a functional inquiry, inquiry uh, into cognitive activities, a mind's role uh, within an interactive uh, environment corresponds to analysis of the processes which engineer and shape mind within this environment. And uh, external, uh, because of that, external media, external media, external technologies can be understood um, not as a mere extension of cognition, and this is a, 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 an explicit critique to the paradigm of extended mind, but as a lever to understand the very structure of cognition and to engineer cognition itself, which is really, really important nowadays. Uh, issue of function, functionalist nuance proposes to explain how functionally properties are realized independently from uh, the structural properties. Within this engineering paradigm, functionalism operates as a heuristic device. Therefore, every nuance we can try to 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 try to to, um, to, to, to describe every nuance, every functional nuance uh, as, a, as a methodological tool aimed to produce new technological forms. And therefore, this leads to my question uh, to, to, to Daniel. Um, among, among all of the functionalist distinction, the engineer approach is the one that asks about how we might have, how, how we might be able to replicate and simulate um, mind and its mental states uh, in other inorganic media. Uh, this question, which is really, really contempor a contemporary question, um, uh, is not only about how we replicate the human, but also how can we engage in the process of uh, a synthetic uh, production um, uh, by, 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 virtue, by virtue of uh, which different media can serve as a prosthetic outsourcing of sent sentient and sapient uh, abilities and this also might refer to the to, to the, the, the tracing back to to sellers to the manifest image of of um, um, of, of man uh, a concept elaborated by Wilfred Seller and therefore uh, what I want to ask to um, to to Daniel is if nowadays we we can argue that all these uh, cognitive capac human capacities capacities uh, such as modeling, prediction, the calculation of probability, uh, per perceptual experience, uh, um, how all of these tools, all of the, these tools are not only uh, merely cognitive human capacities, as I just said, but uh, how they, um, what is the, 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 uh, the, 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 the conceptual uh, background uh, that, that provides a, 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 a proper explanation to the, this engineering approach. Thank you very much. On to Daniel. Uh, hello, everybody. So I have prepared a little very short PowerPoint to, to help me explain my ideas. So what I want to do very briefly is to just go over some very basic uh, conceptual sort of uh, issues concerning the definition of functionalism within its appropriation in philosophy today so as to better understand what exactly is at stake here. So uh, just give me one second to project the relevant PowerPoint. And um, one second. Almost there. Are you guys seeing some brief remarks on the philosophical concept of function? Yes. 
Thank yes. You. Yes, and can you see it when I change the slide? Can you see the slide? Yes. Change? Yes. 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 Great. Okay, so to start with, as Andrea already said, functionalism in its most general, at its most general, it's a theory of cognition. Um, and it postulates that the mind is what it does. And what this really means is that mental states are to be explained, not in terms of the internal properties that materially constitute an entity, but rather we define an entity in terms of its operations. And this approach really goes back all the way to Aristotle. Um, those of you who have read the Anima, for example, knows that Aristotle's account of form is basically what a thing most intrinsically is set to do. But in its modern and contemporary usage, um, it really dates to the work of Putnam and Sellers in the mid-century, in the mid-20th century. And in order to grasp the difference really between this essential difference that, that uh, functionalism draws between, on the one hand, functional constitution and material constitution. As a way of example, you can ask yourself a question. What is a pawn, for example, right? And there's two ways one can answer this kind of question. One can describe the, for example, physical or chemical constitution of a given pawn or, or of all possible pawns, right? P pawns made of wood, of glass, in a computer screen, you name it. Or alternatively, one can describe the role that pawns play invariantly across of all these material manifestations in the context of the game that we call chess. And Sellers, Wilfred Sellers, proposed an analogy with this uh, idea of a game, which of course we owe to Wittgenstein, the idea that using language is playing a kind of game or that language users and rational discursive creatures that enjoy sapient intelligence are capable of playing a particular sort of game which as some of you might know is called the game of given and asking for reasons according to sellers right now what's interesting about this definition of function is that already points to what is its most essential aspect in addition to the fact that it is a pragmatic uh, definition and that is its multiple realizability and the idea is that the definition of the functional definition of what a thing is, is precisely general in the sense that it tells you what anything would have to do in order to be what it is, irrespective of its material constitution. So going back to the pawn example, if we define the role that pawns play within the game of chess, then we are saying what anything, regardless of its material constitution, would have to be able to do in order to count as being a pawn. Right now, in its application to understand the nature of mental states or mental life, cognitive functionalism can be defined in the following way. And this is the definition that I just offer as a heuristic device. But it says a functionalist account of mind is one which explains the intentional states of sentient and sapient beings in terms of how a multiply realizable set of distinctive abilities are jointly realized integrating the kind of perceptual, discursive, agential, and social patterns of behavior we associate with cognition. So the whole idea is that functionalism understands an entity as a system in which the parts jointly allow it to instantiate the kinds of faculties or capacities that we associate with cognition or intelligence more generally, specifically our perceptual and discursive capacities. So, this definition of a entity in terms of a system that instantiates certain functional roles or capacities means that the way we describe a system is not only based on certain patterns of regularities, but which is what uh, in you know uh, contemporary parlance the philosopher Robert Brandom calls reliable differential responsive dispositions, which are re uh, basically reducible to patterns of stimulus response behavior. But more robustly, what we say is that a functional system is organized in terms of what we call feedback control machines, which is tendencies that you can specify in terms of particular faculties that can fail. In other words, 
a functional system is one in which its states are subject to failure. If we can speak of function, we can speak of malfunction. And you can see intuitively why this is an attractive paradigm to explain intentional or cognitive states, because one of the things that is important to explain when, it, when we're ta talking about cognition is the nature of representation and misrepresentation or perception or misperception, the possibility of error. And this is indeed a, a point that I think Hegel already made way back, which was that the very difference between the in itself and the for itself, how things appear to consciousness and how things are, is an intrinsic feature of consciousness, of the kind of apperceptive experience that mindful creatures enjoy. And that without this distinction or the capacity to make this distinction, we don't have consciousness proper. Now, there are different approaches to uh, functionalism, as Andre already mentioned, and I will not uh, you know, stop too much on this just because we don't have much time, but essentially functionalism can be deployed either in metaphysical terms, logical, conceptual terms, or in terms of practical engineering problems. Now, in the metaphysical sense, basically functionalism tries to be reconciled with the prospects of naturalism. That is to say, to explain how it is that natural systems or causal regularities can be explained in functional terms. This is particularly uh, popular in the field of biology, for example, where we explain you know, things like the circulatory system in functional terms, like you know, the role of the heart is to pump blood and so on and so forth. So similarly, a functional cognitivism uh, you know, in th th that attempts to be metaphysical in scope will be particularly close, for example, to neuro neuroscientific paradigms of cognition. Now, logical conceptual paradigms, on the other hand, try to specify cognitive function irrespective of causal constitution. And this might be the approach that uh, most of you are familiar with, if you're familiar with the work, for example, of Reza Negaristani, or also the work of Robert Brandom. The idea there is that you can define the kind of function that characterizes cognitive states irrespective of any kind of causal story about, say, the makeup of brains or any hardware uh, you know, uh, constraints. And finally, there's this practical engineering problem, which is, of course, what Andre was, was talking about, which is not the question of how we characterize cognition or mind in the abstract, the function of cognition in the abstract, but how it is that we might potentially be able to replicate or outsource cognition in other forms or other mediums than our own. And this is a question not only about how we, and this is answering Andrea's question, how we emulate the human in the sense of just simply provide, as it were, a double of human sapiens in an inorganic medium, but how we progressively outsource intelligence by amplifying or modifying our inherent cognitive capacities. So, you know, one of the simplest examples is, of course, perception. You know, the way in which, for example, we through all kinds of technological means, enhance our capacity to perceive and to sense the world through microscopes, through virtual reality helmets, through all kinds of nifty, perhaps interventions into our optical apparatus. And the same, of course, applies in principle to our cognitive capacities. Outsourcing cognition is part of what the functional paradigm does, because if you can isolate the function, the idea is you can build it. And the practical engineering question ties these two dimensions together. Now, I won't read the, that other part. Now, I have just one more real thing that I want to say, which is this other collateral question, which is computationalism, because many times we hear these two terms paired together. And it is important to realize that computationalist variants of functionalism are precisely a variant or a species of functionalism. Functionalism need not be computationalist, but computationalism really is the paradigm that emerges in the modern context since the work of Putnam. And the idea there is to understand the functions that characterize mental activity in analogy with the way in which an algorithmically constructed program or software, a computer program, is instantiated in a specific uh, hardware. So, yeah. no, yes? No, no, no. Hi, in the interest of time, yes. um, we'll have to wrap it up very quickly. Sure, um, one, one minute, is that is that okay? Uh, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, great. So 
this very quick formula function is to material constitution as software is to hardware that is the the punchline that i want to say but finally what i what i wanted to just indicate is that we are currently witnessing something like a, a you know a third wave of functionalism precisely under the computationalist idea whose main impetus is to try to reconcile some of the insights of the german idealist philosophical legacy with the functionalist and computationalist paradigms and this is of course what the work of Nagarastani, Wolfendale, Andrea, myself and others are tried to do and basically um, you know here you can you can read it is the, the two dimensions with Kant and Hegel of what uh, constitutes this kind of merger of German idealism and computationalist functionalism but I, well since in the interest of time we're kind of out of it um, this is a very uh, I'm not going to explain this, obviously. I'm just showing this. This is a teaser, a functional diagram of mine that I'm elaborating as part of my own project to explain in functional cognitive, you know, in functional terms, uh, cognition. And uh, hopefully we can talk about this uh, at some other time. <laughs> okay. So I think, uh, are we good? Thank you so, so yeah. much, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Dan. We are going to move forward with uh, Meredith Singleton Chan and Tom Moynihan. Al, would you like to introduce them? Thank you, Nali. Uh, Meredith is a technologist and co-founder, among other projects, of Print All Over Me, a platform for the creation and customization of sustainable fashion. She is interested in exploring the impact and transformation of computation and technological objects on thought, culture, and artifacts. Tom is a researcher from the UK. He has just submitted his PhD as the of Oxford, fo focusing on intellectual uh, Through his work, he has historically reflected the emerging field of future studies. Uh, they are going to talk about the ethical implicit probabilistic future events ushered in by computational simulation. So I will hand the mic to Meredith now. Um, hi. So we're going to talk about um, hypothetical ethics and what is that? Uh, a few a few moments ago, maybe half an hour ago, we heard that in 2030, um, the environment is going to be in a particular state. It's going to be very hot. You know, it's, going to, it's going to look a different way. And how, how do we know that? Um, it's because we collect data points now and run them through a model or a simulation. Um, and the question is, what is the... What is the epistemological status of, of these um, of these are these facts, are these beliefs of these probabilistic events? And the other question is how can we use these facts or whatever they may be to understand how we ought to act today? So how do we use this information in an ethical ethically. Um, and this is a new problem because only now do we have the ability to run these massive simulations. Um, so I propose this is somewhat different from a deontological ethics. We're not really interested in universal rules of, of you know, in what situations do we always need to act that a simulation will provide us. But this is very, um, it's only in very particular circumstances, almost going back to like an Aristotelian ethics, that these simulations give us insight into. And perhaps uh, the ethics then move over to the rule set of the simulations themselves um, and the computation of different um, recommend, uh, recommendation engines rather than um, from the point of view of the, the um, rather than how to act in every situation. So my main thesis is that we need a new framework, that the traditional frameworks of how to think about these sorts of ethical behaviors um, is, not, is not enough anymore. And that what we really need is an archeology span of prediction. 
Um, and in this way to sort of think of uh, ethics as a, as a collection or sort of a convergence with uh, techne, which historically, you know, there's been a big distinction. Ethics is only about action, whereas the techne is about material. Um, but as we experience this massive de dematerialization of everything, including aesthetics, um, and as things that were once material objects become dematerialized as information, they take on a performative aspect um, and an active aspect. So we now can use this, you know, there's now an ethical component. How do these, how do these things act? How ought they act? Um, so in talking about this, my main, my main question is, you know, how do we think about these events predicted by computer simulations? And it's my question for Tom. And um, what would a new, you know, what are the status of these events or facts? And what would a new ethical theory look like in regards to probabilistic future events predicted by a computer simulation? Anyone hear me? Hello? Uh, I think uh, they dropped out back there. Oh. Did, did, did anything? Second. Okay. Go ahead, Meredith. Did, Hello, did Meredith. It, yes. Did no, I just redo everything? No, that, it's, it's recorded live anyways. But if you want to just like summarize a little bit of what you were saying, so actually Tom can maybe have a more meaningful in, uh, response to it, that would be lovely too. We have time, don't worry, because we skipped the break anyways. OK. So um, my, main, my main question is, you know, what is the, so if we run a simulation and we predict that you know the the uh, there's the Earth is going to um, sea levels are going to rise by twenty percent in twenty thirty. What is the status of that information, the epistemological status? But more importantly, for this talk, you know how 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 are we using is this this information to act today? Do we does this have any kind of ethical import? Um, and what kind of frameworks can we use to think about this? You know these are this is not. This is somewhat different from from a from a deontology or even from a traditional from from a Aristotelian ethics. How do we think about this this action in terms of probabilistic future events? And what you know, my my proposal is that we need an archaeology of prediction um, as we as as uh, as ethics and techne merge because of the dematerialization of almost of everything aesthetics and um action excellent thank you uh perfect question uh particularly yeah the demand for uh, archaeology of prediction um so i yeah the, and also the question of dematerialization so um i would frame that in terms of artificialization and as a basic uh as a basic premise i'd say that uh we need to artificialize in order to, in order to naturalize in the sense that uh, naturalization is the creation of better models of nature. Uh, and science is increasingly artifactual in the sense that these models need to be more and more complicated, more and more uh, simulative, uh, et cetera. And the way that I would like to frame this and bring it back to the demand for an ethical uh, dimension and the de demand for an ethics of prediction 
uh, is by looking at the deep history of prediction and where these uh, capacities and these aptitudes have come from. Uh, and I think that if we look at that, it shows that uh, these, these things have always been practical. So what I mean by that is that, um, that we have to reflect first on uh, the precarities, the positionality and the proprietaries of value uh, before we are even motivated to protect value from a nature consequently revealed as insensitive or non-responsive to value. So that's where the artificialization question comes in because we need to artificialize and become uh, responsive to the fact that value is itself artificial before, and, and therefore extract it from nature uh, before we can uh, be motivated to the product of prediction. So the way that I'd like to talk about this is uh, looking back at the history of prediction, which I think can be split into three distinct phases. Uh, so we have a stage that's currently going on, let's say begins uh, in the early 20th century, uh, beginning in earnest after World War II and the computational revolution uh, there. And that's a stage of computational automation and outdoor predictions to, um, to, uh, to yeah, co uh, computers. And then the previous the previous stage of prediction is one that stretches from the 17th century uh, to uh, the to world war, uh, world. It wasn't Meredith. Can you please m mute yourself? Yeah. Great. Uh, so yeah, so there's the the computational automational stage, and then prior to that, there's this stage of mathematical rigorization, which is consequent upon the development of calculus. Uh, which allows us to resolve nature into uh, time-stepping procedures. What that means is, you know, calculus allowed us to compute varying rates of change, which allowed nonlinear functions such as population growth, uh, cometary paths, to become uh, numerically tractable. Um, and so you have calculus developing through Leibniz and Newton uh, in the 17th century. And then you also have uh, the development of probabilism, probabilism, which happened slightly earlier. Uh, and that begins with uh, Gerolamo Cardano, who was the first to write a formalization of games of chance. And he was the first person to really think of, he translated the dice, each individual dice throw is an expression of a larger and abstract state space of possibilities. And his breakthrough was using numerical notation to track frequencies within that reference class. Uh, so that was the first time that probability took off. So Cardano initiated modernity's filiation with probabilism. Uh, and when you get those two strands combining, which happens around the 19th century, uh, you start to see scientific foresight in its recognizable way. Uh, so you have the computational automation and then the mathematical rigorization prior to that. Uh, and both of these stages are themselves dependent upon a prior semantic clarification, uh, which happens at the very beginning of modernity and the close of the Middle Ages. Uh, and I would like to focus in on that because I think it shows the, what I was saying earlier, that prediction has always been ethically involved. Uh, as with all things in knowledge, it is tacitly a question of deontology before it is one of ontology. Um, so I would start by noting that uh, prediction did not exist in the ancient world. Uh, they had divination instead. So there was fortuna rather than foresight. And uh, the reasons for this was because uh, the ancient philosophy allowed no distinction between our conceptual frame upon nature and nature itself. Uh, so what this meant was that they believed that nature is inherently conceptual in structure, such that nature could have no autonomy from uh, conception. This meant that natural possibility was entirely reduced to the empirically experienced. Uh, and this meant that, um, uh, that the radically unexpected as a semantic category simply wasn't available. So not only the ability, but also the very motivation to, uh, to prognose was absent. Now, the reasons for this are complex, but uh, they mostly are due, due to the language of possibility available at the time, uh, i.e. the modal language. So uh, ancient philosophy, broadly speaking, was convinced that the only legitimate concepts are concepts that refer directly to nature. Uh, so 
this had the significant salient consequence that all possibilities uh, had to refer to possibilities that are guaranteed to at some point be actualized, uh, which has very important consequences. So one of them being that all talk of what should or ought to be the case is entirely reducible to fact, state, fact statements or talk of what is or will be the case. Uh, so what this in turn means is that there is absolutely no ability for a robust distinction between value and fact. So for the ancients, whatever is, is just. Uh, and this meant that this meant that nature was essentially presumed to be inherently judicial or jurisprudent in structure. Uh, and that meant that there was, you know, no uh, appreciation for its, uh, for, for the unexpected, basically. Um, now, this all changes in the Middle Ages. Uh, the late Middle Ages um, and the beginning of modernity itself lies in this shift. So what happens here is uh, you get the first entrance of counterfactuals and possible worlds into uh, philosophical discourse. So that's reference to entirely artificial scenarios that require no basis in actual fact. So absolutely no basis in actual fact. Uh, and it's during the 13th century that you first get to see this kind of discourse. Uh, the context being Christian and Islamic theologians talking about how God could have made the world entirely otherwise. Uh, so as a consequence of talking about this, um, as a consequence of talking about contingents entirely beyond experience, uh, these theologians accidentally started to reflect upon the contingency of experience itself. Uh, put differently, if the world could be absolutely otherwise, otherwise than it is humanly experienced, uh, then human experience is revealed, human experience and its strictures and structures are revealed to themselves be contingent or not necessary limits on reality. Uh, another way of putting this is that uh, meaningfully referring to entirely artificial scenarios, so uh, scenarios that have no basis in actual fact, um, is actually tacitly to reflect upon the artificiality of meaning itself. So the fact that reason has concerns and interests that need no basis in natural facts. Uh, so having revealed the uh, judicial and uh, conceptual contents and not themselves founded in nature, uh, they were first um, it facilitated first responsivity to the fact that um, nature itself has no, no, uh, hasn't got this judicial structure. And this meant that, um, hang on, let me. Yeah, so pre appreciating that nature is not conceptual or judicial in structure, which is identical with the artificialization of justice and conceptual content, facilitated first receptivity into natural possibilities entirely beyond the currently experienced, what is historically expected, and what is morally lawful. This is the birth of the future as a meaningful semantic category. Moreover, in first lubricating responsivity to natural existence and possibilia entirely beyond current conceptual capture and moral justification, it is the birthplace of articulations of mind independence, as well as being the cradle of robust, i.e. scientific realisms, so an important thing here is probability prior to, uh, prior to this point referred to the normative weight of scriptural authority, which is in, inherently an anthropomorphizing uh, idea. So what this meant was that nature basically just was its scriptural uh, capture in, 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 in text, right? Uh, so after this collapse of the assumption that na you know, nature is entirely judicial, you get probability shifting its meaning to this entirely uh, desemantified idea of purely quantitative measurement of causal weighting. Uh, and to use a slightly self-defeating metaphor, it means that, um, that we no longer uh, have to ventriloquize nature with normative language and we allow it to have its own causal testimony, which is entirely resolvable into nu numerical probabilistic um, expressions. Uh, so, shall, shall, I, shall I start wrapping up? Yeah, okay, fine. So, um, <clears throat> uh, what I would say to wrap this up very quickly is that um, 
the basic point that is in discovering the non-natural essence of rules and justice, uh, we were first driven to predict these items. Um, sorry, no, that's wrong. <laughs> uh, in um, discovering the non-natural essence of rules and justice, we were first driven to protect these items from an unruly and extrajudicial nature. Uh, this shows that the future, as it emerges an ob as an object for anticipation and as a target for simulation across modernity, is not a theoretical matter without first being a practical concern. We first had to realize the stakes involved in ignorance before we were driven to mitigate against it. We buffer against the future because we realized it was practically meaningful to do so. The loss of firm foundations that initiated modernity just is reasons undertaking of self-responsibility in the sense that one is not driven to be responsible for oneself and to be self-determining without articulating the stakes that, are, uh, that actually create the content of that responsibility. Um, and this undertaking of self-responsibility in concrete terms can be witnessed uh, as the ramification of our apparatus of anticipation and prediction across the modern age, from its nascent form as the formalization of games of chance in the Renaissance to its contemporary incarnation as the megastructure of planetary computation in the 21st. Thank you so much, Tom and Meredith, and thank you for your uh, interesting points of discussion so much. Um, we will finish interlocutories with uh, Benjamin Bratton and Leonardo de la Noche. But let's take two minutes for logistics. Yeah, yeah, two minutes for logistics. Um, high quality uh, internet because we lower the quality of the video. We want to make sure to go to uh, high quality internet because we lowered the quality of the video. So, if Ben could bear with us for a minute, yeah, okay. and everyone else. So let's just first and Fantastic, we'll thank you. Okay, let's just switch Alan can keep the room still. Alan, please keep the room. Spike events. Change the quality here. Go full signal. Okay, here we go. How, what? Not that it makes any difference to the bad lights, so but still. No. Mm -hmm. I know. So. Yeah, just one sec. Okay, so I will read the bios, okay. Uh, Leonardo de la Noche is an art historian who explores technological realities with art and design as navi navigational tools. He is currently co-curating the research series at the Technopolitical Cartography on show at the Head New Institute and the Stedelijk Museum showing in the spring of 2019. Benjamin Braddon is a sociologist, architectural and design theorist, as well as a professor of visual art, arts at the University of California, San Diego. He is currently the program director at the Strelka Institute in Moscow. Uh, they are talking about the Vertical Atlas project, a new atlas intended to be used as a navigational tool in the complex technogeographies of today. So I am handing the mic to Leonardo. Okay, so um, thanks a lot for the invitation uh, I th and thanks also to the other speakers for the great talks uh, during this afternoon. I guess um, this conversation between B and Benjamin will be a bit different uh, as we are going to sort of present and discuss some questions uh, that emerged um, during our Vertical Atlas uh, research project that we started about uh, six months ago. 
So we have to also to shout out to our fellow conspirators in this project who are uh, Arthur Steiner from HIVOS Digital Earth and uh, Klaus Katerbrauer from uh, the New Institute. So um, the digital, uh, the, sorry, the vertical atlas project um, is aimed at mapping, mapping a new sort of technopolitical cartography of the world today. So we look at the geopolitics of the world uh, through technology and in particular we um, start from the sort of recently uh, developed concept by, by Benjamin himself of hemispherical stacks. I'm sure he can explain it better than me and uh, it, it takes uh, more time than five minutes, but I'm gonna just try to, in one sentence, um, to bring it to your attention. So hemispherical stacks are, 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 stack, are stacks that are sort of located geographically. So they're actually situated somewhere. So you have this uh, accidental megastructure um, of the stack, which is, uh, which is planetary, and there is no outside from it, but within this planetary interior uh, that we are enmeshed with, uh, there is no unity, there is actually a plurality. So uh, Benjamin already debuted um, more than a year ago, uh, several ones like the Bat stack in China or the Gaffa stack, which is more, no, more North Atlantic, and during the project, uh, basically we held um, we hold research labs in which we try to dive into uh, five uh, specific geozones. These ge geozones are namely uh, Europe, so the the sort of friction between the European Union and the GAFA stack, so Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Apple, uh, Russia, and the sort of post-Soviet countries. Uh, China and the constellation of its different sovereignties like mining operations in Congo, uh, WeChat and other cyber environments. Uh, Africa, so movements to sort of East Africa, so the, the technological context of Kenya all the way to Lagos in Nigeria and the, um, the Gulf and the Middle East. So we, are st we still have three to go. We already did the one on Europe uh, and Russia and how we do it is we gather uh, um, a group of practitioners that come from uh, very different backgrounds from the Estonian government to artists, designers. Uh, we had in, invest, uh, we had even investment funders uh, in the group, and we try to problematize and see what are the clashes in terms of um, sovereignty between uh, between different stacks and within these uh, within these geozones. Because as this stack don't completely overlap often with the Westphalian state, and maybe the only case, uh, partial case, is, is China. Uh, in that sense, but most of them are spread across uh, regions and continents. And again, uh, the Gafa stack is a good example. So from from uh, from California mainly to to Israel, to New Zealand, to big portions of Africa and Europe. So uh, th this project is aimed actually at creating um, a cartography. So that both both visual and uh, and sort of uh, discursive. And we have been now very much um, in discussion how to bring this cartography. Uh, actually about what does it mean to create maps and how do how, how you how you can do that and what are um, the tools to do that so my my first question uh, to Benjamin will uh, actually related to this problem of cartographically uh, represent and uh, make m new maps that are operational in the world so I'm, I'm gonna jump in I ben is here okay hi Ben Hi. So, uh, like you mentioned, uh, this Wait. There, there is something uh, going on with your voice. It's very much uh, metallic. It's uh, the There is it's sort of uncanny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's this merging of man and machine. Uh, they're trying to figure it out at the moment. Uh, okay. Ben, would you be able to um, uh, log out or jump out, jump back in? To the okay, let's try again. <laughs> okay, this sometimes happens. I mean, that's a nice icebreaker anyhow for him. It's so a it's the collapse of the, <laughs> this Gaffa stack and during the. Um, Bernardo. Yes. Um, you consider yourself an art historian. No, that's just a label I have to put. That's just a label. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> to explain my parents what I do, oh. mostly, yeah, I'm just to navigate to this world. You work as a curator as well. Well, on this project, I mean, I th I think the, the team has a sort of 
it's, it's a curatorial team, but we organize it, um, researching, etc. But Ben is back. How's this? How do I shout? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay. We can hear you well. Okay, good. So um, I jump in with the first question, and then yeah. you take it from there. Okay, great. <laughs> So in the project, we approach the stack itself uh, as a map through which we locate, and then we draw maps of these different geozones. But at the same time, the specific maps uh, that emerge from, from this work are themselves tools to redraw the general map of the stack of the planet. What are the implications of this double movement from particular to universal and back? Right, thank you. Um, thank you, Leonardo, for the introduction for the, for the question. Um, also, thanks to New Center for putting this uh, putting this event together. I, I, I'm a great admirer of the New Center project. I've had the opportunity to to teach a course um, at New Center a couple of years ago. That was um, a really wonderful experience. So I'm, I'm very happy to bring these two uh, bring these two projects together. Uh, the as you mentioned, part of the impetus for the Vertical Atlas project, as as Im implied in the name, is is one that is um, cartographic uh, and I, I think that and by dividing the our, our our research into these geo zones as you as you've identified it um, allows us to explore a particular kind of dynamic between a generic uh, between the generic and the universal in in the stack model and how the stack model may have a uh, becoming to work to organize a uh, geopolitical uh, procedures in its own image in in particular locations um, to compare and contrast this with uh, an understanding and model of the plan of planetarity um, which as you suggest uh, implies a kind of global uh, a global interior uh, that is integrated, if also subdivided, and a third contrast between the these these procedures, which are themselves not the same, and the local uh, the local context and conditions by which the this the stack schema is organized, uh, is deployed, uh, becomes a medium and expression for particular kinds of political, economic. Um, and informatic expressions, not least of which um, have to do with the organization of artificial intelligence, as many of the of the uh, previous speakers have explored in, I think, extremely interesting uh, interesting kinds of ways, and in ways that are uh, quite complementary to our to our uh, approaches. Uh, in, in a nutshell, we might say that because no two uh, no two cultures would identify or define artificial in the same way uh, no two cultures would uh, define intelligence exactly in the same way it's unlikely that the ex that the organization uh, expression and interaction with artificial intelligence would uh, would be the, the, the same as well and yet there are common um, common fixed uh, and standard procedures for the the ways in which uh, data is sensed, modeled, uh, and used to train uh, forms of synthetic cognition uh, that have a technical and uh, functional regularity uh, that exceeds or precedes um, any of those um, any of those specifics. Uh, and so, it's the not the necessarily the contradiction, but the dynamic between these processes that I think is at the, the heart of the of the research project here. Um, more specifically, I think that we're we're looking at how uh, how data uh, has become a kind of sovereign substance um, that the and how the circumscription of particular geopolitical zones, um, as you've identified around the North Atlantic, China, and Africa, and other, is not only um, uh, evolving towards a kind of multipolar geopolitical arrangement. Um, but that this multipolarity is, in ways that are di difficult to ignore, isomorphic to the boundaries of particular um, stack apparatuses. Uh, that the that the opposition and even counter weaponization between a North Atlantic GAFA stack and the, the Chinese stack um, mapping to the 
the geopolitical tensions at work there is not is not coincidental. That the capturing and modeling and production, in, in, in essence, the the capacity to produce a larger model um, of the uh, of the world in which the geopolitical power would operate, uh, a kind of uh, uh, synthetic political ontology, uh, if you like, uh, is one that is uh, that we see as a kind of uh, defining, if not explicit, project um, of this of this phenomenon. And the danger, of course, being is that any of these has the the is equally likely to constitute something like of a Potemkin ontology uh, for any of its for any of its powers. Um, but the the, uh, the the questions of the previous speakers have raised around um, uh, prospection and futurity and how the the modeling and understanding of, of projective futures and predictive futures um, might operate uh, at the level of a specific project. We we are in a way um, trying to map and provide a certain kind of preemptive archaeology. Of, of how that uh, ethics of simulation um, is not only something that we would will 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 at some point need to get a handle on, but how it is in fact it is at the core of contemporary should be at the core of contemporary political science uh, and what we used to call international uh, international relations. And so let me let me hand it back to you, and we can perhaps continue the back and forth a little bit if you want. If there's more specific uh, paths that you'd like to lead us down yeah i think that you partially already addressed uh my my second question so perhaps we can uh bring it more to the to the design level in a way so sure. um so among many other things the stack model problematizes and reveals this planetary um that there is no planetary outside whether that's technological or not and so the hemispherical stacks thesis entails that the interior uh, as already mentioned a couple of times times uh, is plural rather than one but then right. um, s since we are we are gonna produce a, a publication out of all the research that the, the, the network of experts is uh, helping us um, to carry on and to carry out uh, what can be ways actually of modeling and mapping this plurality well I think that's what we're I, I think exactly right that's what we're uh, I think that's the uh, both the means and the end of this of this initiative uh, the kinds of and to attempt to uh, uh, to explore what what is gleaned by different cartographic strategies in in in, in modeling this uh, different starting points different um, rhetorics of represent rhetorics of representation that may be um, that may be graphical uh, or discursive. I, I think while we're there's I, I think there's a degree of of presupposition, uh, not 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 axiomatic necessarily, but that some variation of stack schema is a is part of what provides a, a kind of generic interoperability, at least at the level of of of, um, of comparison between uh, instances in this larger plurality. Um, that's really taken as a, that is, is is taken as as a kind of uh, as a kind of starting point. Um, I, I think the impetus for a, a cartographic uh, imaginary here uh, is one that is that there's I, I think still a notion that a kind of uh, ethics of recognition and exchange beyond the uh, beyond and within these emergent. Uh, uh, Biotechnical uh, uh, ontologies that is being uh, composed and constructed through in the form of the hemispherical stacks um, is necessary, and that a kind of feudal neo feudal patchwork enclosure or amplified weaponization of the of the geographical scale data models is unlikely to lead to the forms of social and ecological. Um, the forms of social ecological governance and media re remediation that we're that we're uh, most interested in. Um, I, I think to the point though on the inside outside that, that you raise, I, I just want to underscore. I think that uh, I think part another part I think starting point of, of this initiative um, is, is as you suggest that 
what the planetarity can't be imagined or understood or shouldn't be imagined understood as, as the inverse or opposition to plurality, um, especially as that later term plurality is perhaps to a certain degree over associated with uh, the local and the vernacular and the unique experiences of historical pasts. Um, so it's well, uh, absolutely. Well, it's quite certain that we all, um, looking back on different separate pasts, um, that may in many ways set the terms of those geographic, political, technological relations. Um, we will uh, inevitably inhabit futures that are conjoined, uh, conjoined in ways that are uh, probably um, uh, uh, quite. Uh, in some ways quite uh, uh, un, uh, unexpected. And so there's a binding, I think in the comparative, the, the note, the comparative logic of the project is one that sees itself in advance of not only mapping the situation as it is, but providing a model for that binding, the potential paths of binding uh, to come. Uh, it, a plurality within that planetarity um, that is not formulated just as a, a kind of addition or multiplication of the local computational idioms of Europe or China or America or Russia or so forth or any of the geozones we're looking at, um, not as a kind of viewpoint collage of these various uh, reified traditions or perspectives, but uh, rather, as you suggest, uh, about the, the, uh, the range of possibilities for the coordination uh, and linkages uh, within that common planetary interior um, that it, it, as such. And I think just, just as the last point on here, as another, I think, kind of starting point for the investigation that has been here has been the um, uh, a little bit of a pushback on the idea that, that planetary computation should be understood historically as a phenomenon that 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 made the outside disappear, that in fact erased and outside, but to to argue rather that it was a a, a phenomenon, um, a generational phenomenon that, in essence, revealed that there never was uh, an outside to begin with, uh, and so shifts the terms of the the between the 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 spaces of of, of mutual inter, uh, interiorization uh, and interoperability around that that common schema. So. That is to say, the mapping project at work, the cartographic project at work, is at once descriptive. Um, what are the different ways in which it's possible to provide cartographic images of a situation that um, may seem too complex to grasp? Um, a predictive logic to try to get a sense of what the likely uh, near and long-term futures of, of a present vectors might be. Um, but more importantly, it, it's the normative question of what are the spaces of possibility of integration that we would um, that we would wish to designate and design and to bring about great so Do you have anything, you'd like to respond? anything to respond well actually this is this, I mean this is a this is a, a back and forth but it's actually very much what we are have been discussing already uh, for a while and we will keep on discussing as the different constraints of making a publication and having a research project kind of emerge. So yeah, it would be all for me, for sure. Thank you so much, Ben, Leo, everybody, um, for having Thank joined you. us and having been here. Um, that's great. So that wraps it up. Um, we will take a break, about 45 minute break, um, before we screen the film by Manuel Correa call, uh, called Art Offline, um, which will be followed by a discussion with Patrick Chavos and Julieta Aranda and the artist himself, Manuel. So that's Leonardo, right. Do you wanna, you wanna just give them the URL to make sure that everyone can follow the project? Yes, yes, that was supposed to be in the visuals, but we cannot open them, but that's a good one. So you can go on verticalatlas.net and um, and there we have already on the report from island.eu, which is the first event relating to the sort of North Atlantic geozone, soon the one on the Russian and post-Soviet uh, stocks, uh, so to speak, and the next events uh, will be this, this spring in Rotterdam, if any one of you is around, on Africa, Gulf, 
and China. We will publish anything, uh, uh, anyhow, sorry, uh, everything on the website and then publication in, in some time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, Thank you. Anybody has any, any questions to ask any of the instructors or the speakers at the Paris? Um, just send them to me or Alan. You can find us. Um, it's Alan Diaz, Alan, A L A N dot D I A Z at thenewcenter.org, or myself, Natalie Agostini at thenewcenter.org. Hello, and for those of you who are going to hey, stick. Mohammed. Hello, how are you doing? Thank you Good, so man. much. Nice to see you. And for you who are going to be sticking around, we are going to show Manuel's film live, but it's not going to get recorded because it's copyrighted. But we're going we're gonna to broadcast the film. We're going to try to broadcast the film from here. That's going to be starting at 8 p.m., followed by a panel between Julieta Aranda Manuel, moderated by Patrick Chavez. So thanks again for this long uh, educational session. It was a good sampling of what we do at the New Center. And see you around very soon in about an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, and also wanted to thank Comme des Garçons for sponsoring our event. And yes, because as you can see, we are like sponsored by Comme des Garçons. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.